hey, you, the person sitting there, you probably don't know what a war crime actually is. Look up like any tactical shooter video game on this platform and half of the titles seem to have the word war crime in them, like a, as a joke, obviously, but is what's being shown on the screen actually a war crime? See, if you grew up in the military like me, you probably were told what a war crime is by a 38 year old alcoholic who didn't actually have the authority to tell you what a war crime is. And he was also probably told 20 years ago by an alcoholic 38 year old. So what exactly is a war crime? Crime. Who gets to decide what is and what isn't one, and why do 14 year olds on YouTube think it's the peak of comedy? <laughs> Let's get started. Now you might be surprised, there's not just like one piece of paper that constitutes what every war crime is. Your mind probably just went to, oh, the Geneva Conventions, obviously. And then some like edgy Facebook comment is gonna say, oh, don't you mean the Geneva suggestions? That joke was funny, like 15 years ago, please just get new material. But the Geneva Conventions have only been signed by a handful of countries and also leaves some things up for interpretation, just like any other set of international rules. And there is no one master list of them. Each country has a few or just no signed agreements that determine what they will and will not allow their military to perform in times of war and this leads to a lot of misconceptions. To add to this, sometimes a country will sign a document that outlines illegal conduct of warfare but doesn't ratify it, meaning they'll support it but they technically don't have to follow it. The United States, for example, has five international agreements signed and four domestic laws on the books, each of course being hundreds of pages long. Some of these go back to the 1700s and are written about as clear as mud, but the newer ones are written in such dense legalese that you basically need a law degree to even begin to understand them. Of course, if you're a 19 year old grunt hyped up on Zen and bang energy drinks, you're not going to care about any of this, which actually poses its own entire problem of fitting the laws of war into something that every soldier can easily follow. The problem being, how do you package all of that into a simple set of rules that means that said 19 year old doesn't have to learn what the word tribunal means? The UN, I think, gives a pretty good definition across the board of what a war crime is. War crimes are the those violations of international humanitarian law, treaty, or customary law that incur individual criminal responsibility under international law. And they must always take place in the context of an armed conflict, either international or non-international. The UN also basically operates as if everyone has agreed to the same list of war crimes, even if they haven't. So basically you're putting your military at risk if you violate the more common ones, even if you haven't signed or ratified anything. Basically, if you are in the 99.74% of countries that are in the UN, you're gonna have to follow these rules whether you like it or not. And if you do break them, it's considered a war crime at the international level. Ironically though, there are a lot of things that aren't war crimes, but people seem to love to think that they are. Let's take the classic example. You can't use a 50 caliber round on a person, usually followed with a tongue in cheek comment that you have to aim for their water can or something on their body for it to be legal because you're targeting their equipment, not the actual soldier. This is not a war crime. like at all. People seem to forget that uh, the Army and Marine Corps have under barrel grenade launchers that shoot 40 millimeter rounds that explode on impact. But for some reason, a 50 cal is deemed too overpowered. I'm not following. I think this follows the same logic as those guys who for some reason brag that even if you miss with a 50 cal round, it's strong enough to like rip someone's arm off. If you miss a person and they the bullet passes by within like a couple of feet, it'll rip a, a limb off. Which is just fundamentally not true because this is not all gillied up. But the same thing goes for shotguns, flamethrowers, by phosphorus rounds, and MRE spoons. Literally all of these are allowed, including incendiary weapons, but with a little asterisk. So let's just talk about that real quick. Incendiary weapons are defined under the Geneva Conventions as weapons or munitions designed to set fire to objects or cause burn or respiratory injury to people through the action of flame heat or combustion thereof, resulting from a chemical reaction of a flammable substance such as napalm or white phosphorus. But really the only real restrictions on these kinds of weapons is ensuring they don't cause undue destruction, at least in the context of civilian and non-military targets. And that makes sense, you know, if you need to destroy a building, maybe just drop one JDAM on it, you don't need to napalm the entire city block. Because if you did not know, fire does spread. And if you start a small fire in building one, there's a good chance it's gonna spread a hundred buildings down the road if no one's there to contain the fire, which they're probably not if it's an active war zone. What this boils down to is that if you're a commander on the ground and you want to use incendiary weapons and you're in more of a hybrid space where you have civilian infrastructure and military targets, you have to take special care that the weapons that you're using only affect the military targets and not the non-legitimate civilian targets. But this also busts the other common myth that you can't use white phosphorus on people because it's considered too torturous or something. And the reason you can use white phosphorus on people is that the fumes from white phosphorus aren't what kill you. 
it's the burning particulates that do and then turn you into a crusty husk of a human being. Believe it or not, there have technically been no recorded casualties in history of the fumes from white phosphorus killing another human. Uh, they said the same thing about killer whales though, and you're not gonna find me climbing into Shamu's enclosure. I'll leave it at that. Now the rules that regard the actual outlawed ammunitions and weapon types are kind of a little bit all over the place and logically don't make sense a lot of the times, and you have to look at it historically why those things were made. So for example, under the Geneva Conventions, if you run across a 17 year old scared conscript with a plastic fork, it is completely illegal to burn them to death from 50 feet away with a flamethrower. But you know what it's not legal? Pepper spray or a taser. Make that make sense, Justin. I'm gonna try to. See, most of our definitions of war crimes didn't actually come about until the turn of the 20th century and really didn't come into modernity until the end of the First World War after seeing the horrific effects of chemical warfare and entire populations maimed and scarred in the worst ways possible. Chemical and biological warfare was an easy thing to outlaw, but things like pepper spray or CS gas fall into those categories because they imitate the initial effects of other seaburn agents like mustard gas. If you hit a formation of enemies with CS gas, also known as tear gas, they're probably going to think it's an actual chemical agent, think the gloves are off, and start launching actual seaburn stuff at you. And now you just escalated the entire conflict to include chemical warfare. Hollow points are also another thing that people might not realize is a war crime. And this rule actually goes back to the 1899 Hague Convention, which outlawed any bullets that expand or change their form after they've hit a target. And this includes not just hollow points, but also soft points often used for hunting animals and those really cringed overpriced concealed carry rounds your uncle brags about. Basically, the reasoning behind this is because hollow points and other rounds rapidly deform or break apart inside of a person, they create wounds that are unnecessarily harsh and would permanently maim someone without killing them. While a standard full metal jacket round would still take someone out of the fight or just kill them outright, but with a lower chance of long-term effects if they survive. And this is the same logic behind the use of things like tasers or dazzling devices that could blind or deafen a combatant. Basically, you're just inflicting pain on them that could lead to permanent injury, but it's not actually achieving military goals. And that's what's called unnecessary suffering. Basically, inflicting bad stuff onto an enemy that has no purpose and achieving military objectives. So shooting someone with a full metal jacket and shooting someone with a hollow point are going to take both people out of the fight, but if both survive, the person with the FMJ wound is probably not gonna go the rest of their life as a crippled person. It's more humane to shoot people that way, if you can even classify it as that. And ultimately, that is what all war crimes boil down to, preventing unnecessary suffering from both soldiers and civilians. Oh, but does this mean war is woke now? And Dark Brandon is gonna fill all of our bombs with flowers and pronouns? No. No, considering most of these rules came about way back in the early 20th century. And there's also more to it than just preventing unnecessary death and suffering. One thing I find interesting that some people bring up is that once they hear, oh, napalm and flamethrowers are war crimes, why don't we just use them all the time? And the thing is those and then actual war crimes don't even make sense in the context of like a military strategy in a tactical sense. Hollow point rounds have very poor penetration, meaning they're easily stopped by body armor and can't penetrate cover. Nerve gas is questionably useful and you can't guarantee it won't blow into your face if the wind changes. Plus, if you're trying to seize an area covered in chemical agents, it's a lot harder for your own troops to operate in it, let alone defend against a counterattack. Flamethrowers are cool, but they're incredibly unwieldy, dangerous for the user, and require you to get pretty close, and you're better off just launching a thermobaric rocket into whatever it is you want to destroy. Yeah, you can kill someone with a 50 cal all day, but odds are you probably have something that will do the job just fine in the smaller caliber, meaning you can save your 50 cal ammo for a target that actually needs it. And that's why tanks and armored vehicles have coaxial guns. Yeah, you can pink mist a human being with a 120 millimeter Sabo round traveling at 3,750 miles per hour, but you should probably save that ammo for a tank. I mentioned earlier that these war crimes only can take place in times of actual warfare. And in a war, everyone is placed into two categories, combatants and non-combatants, basically legitimate and non-legitimate military targets. And this isn't like just some vague definition. There are very strict rules on what makes someone a combatant and what makes someone a non-combatant. Combatant. Legally, combatants are the following. Members of the armed forces except medical personnel and religious personnel, meaning you can't shoot Doc or Chap. Members of militia or other volunteer corps like organized resistance movements. Members of forces who profess allegiance to a government or authority who engage in fighting, so think cops or paramilitary organizations within the government. 
And then finally, Levian Mas, basically unorganized civilians who have taken up arms against an army. So your buddy with a cheap AR with red parts who can't run a mile will fall into this category. In order to be considered a legal combatant, you also have to distinguish yourself very clearly from the civilian population. And if you don't do those things and you still fight, you lose your rights as a prisoner of war. And if you're captured when that happens, well, I hope you like dimly lit damp rooms and never seeing your family again. Being a combatant legally means that an enemy army can basically do whatever they want to do in order to take you out of the fight. But it's actually pretty easy to lose your combatant status. Almost as easy as your mom. See, combatant status only applies to someone who's physically capable and willing to fight. Meaning if you're too injured to fight or you surrender, wham, bam, you're no longer a combatant and it's illegal to kill you. And this rule also comes into effect with the attack on parachutists law. Basically, if you start your day as a pilot and ended as an amateur skydiver, once that parachute deploys, you are now an hors de combat, as the French say, and cannot be shot anymore. Uh, worth noting, if you're a paratrooper, it's just full game from the second you exit that aircraft. Now this brings us to the part of the video where I talk about probably the most commonly debated aspect of what is and what isn't a war crime, the double tap. For those of you who don't know, double tapping typically implies that once an enemy is down and you are clearing through an objective, you give them one last dose of intermediate rifle cartridge in order to ensure they're actually dead. The idea is that you don't want to risk getting shot in the back by someone either not as wounded as you thought or is just faking being dead, which is itself a war crime. There have been full peer-reviewed published studies on this topic, and even the best studied nuanced answers to the act of double tapping is, it's complicated. I specifically like the part where it says because shooting a civilian once is illegal, shooting them twice is also illegal. Sometimes you really just gotta spell it out for some people. See, the issue comes from the fact that once a soldier is wounded to the point of being incapacitated on the ground, they're no longer a combatant, but that can be hard to determine if you're in the middle of a firefight. But the answers to double tapping being a war crime are kind of like my fruity cousin in that it falls on a spectrum. On one end, you have making sure someone is dead when they weren't even dead to begin with, and that's firmly a war crime. In the middle gray area, you have, I don't know if that person was down or was not down. Also, they were far away and it's loud and everyone's yelling at me. And then on the not a war crime side of the spectrum, you have guy was wounded, but decided to go for round two and engaged us again. That's not a war crime. Believe it or not, it's actually illegal to shoot a dead body, even if you were a thousand percent sure that the person is dead, like they have no head or something, because it makes it harder for the body to be identified according to articles 15 through 17 of the Geneva Conventions. Growing up in the army, I was always taught if they're in front of you, it's not a war crime, valid target. If they're behind you, you can't turn around and shoot them because that's a war crime. I always assumed some UN ref would pop out of the woods and call offsides or something, uh, but I don't know. For the US, this is all codified into the Law of Armed Conflict with the LOAC, a 1,254-page document outlining how things like pillaging villages, stealing livestock, and other acts of innocent tomfoolery are all outlawed and will send you to jail. Now, if you're just like an ASVAB waiver with a third grade reading level, how are you on earth supposed to comprehend and keep all this in mind while in a war zone with people actively trying to kill you? The answer is ROE, or Rules of Engagement. ROE basically sets the left and the right limits of what you are and are not allowed to do, what kind of ammunitions and weapon systems you're allowed to use and where, and if you want to use things that don't fall into those categories, what level of approval do you need in order to use them? Now, a lot of times you'll hear stories of troops complaining that ROE is too strict, especially in like a hybrid urban setting, but a lot of these are made for two reasons. One, if you accidentally kill a civilian, there's a good chance his buddies are going to pick up arms and start fighting against you. Now you have 10 extra guys that wanted you dead at the end of the day that you didn't have when you started. And also, believe it or not, veterans who have not been allowed to go on murderous rampages in foreign countries typically do better in society after the war is over. And if you don't believe me, literally just watch like any Vietnam documentary. Uh, so no, unfortunately, uh, you are not committing war crimes in your Star Wars modded server on squad, and neither am I for strapping a claymore to my Roomba. In closing, I would usually say, hopefully you found this information helpful, but I'm praying that this information remains useless for the rest of your life. Thanks for watching, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.